This might sound like piling on the parents after last week's podcast. Still, I've been through some pretty rough experiences with swim club boards, and in each time, the club and the swimmers suffered. This podcast is called Club Leadership, a Horror Story for a reason. And while this is another one of those talks that's uncomfortable to have, it is one that needs to happen, not because it is happening, but to make sure it can't happen. Maybe this is as much for me as it is for everyone listening. More proof that Coach Mike is letting me do these because he's sure he can claim I'm losing my mind. This is the Swim Coach Dad Podcast, and I'm Victor Swim Club Coach, Scott Wisner. I was on deck one time, and a parent from the club's board for the club I was coaching commented that someone had contacted her. I think she was a new member of the board of the club, something like that. Anyway, the parent told this board member now that she was on the board she could help fix things and there were a lot of things that needed to change when i was thinking about this podcast i remember what that really meant there are three different models of swim club management some of you know this parent owned nonprofit, gov- parent governed whatever institute owned like a y or a college swim club and then coach owned i've worked with all three types and found the advantages and disadvantages with all of them Funny thing that some of the advantages and disadvantages have to do with the frequency of the changes in leadership or management, if you will. Coach-owned or owned and managed by the same person year after year, and so the club stays on the same path, right or wrong, year after year. Institute-owned might have changes in coaches, but they are managed by the same group for several years usually. Problems happen when a new Y director comes in with different ideas or when the college administration changes and decides the club isn't something they want to deal with or want to deal too much with. Then the parent-governed clubs, which make up most of the clubs in USA Swimming, the parent boards change regularly with most changing leadership every probably two or three years, if not more. At the same time, at least most of the time, I was working another job. I guess you could call it my day job, working for companies with owners and boards of their own, either as an employer or as a consultant. And like the swim clubs I was coaching for, I found advantages and disadvantages in how these, those companies were managed. There were politics involved in every position I've had, but some were worse than others. And leadership was very different among all of them, with some of the leaders I worked for were tough, unrelenting, with high expectations, sometimes unreasonable, calling me on weekends and at night. But then there were a couple of managers or owners I worked for who were outstanding. What made them successful was staying in their lane and avoiding micromanaging, especially in areas they didn't know much about. I did was as simple as forcing the conflicting sides to stay in their own lane sometimes when I was managing these people. Most of the time, there was dysfunction from too much interfering in the areas of others, especially with family-owned businesses with multiple family members involved. They just couldn't help telling each other what to do. In more than 30 years of these kind of day jobs, none were no-win situations like I found myself in one particular club. And here's how it went. When we joined the club, parents on the board were financially vested in the club, so they voted down increases in fees every year for more than seven years, so they didn't have to pay more. To compensate for the lower revenues, expenses were cut, in particular the coaching staff, so most practices, there was one coach working with three or four levels of swimmers. They would never pay for quality coaching, so they got mediocre coaching at best. Meets were only attended by one coach, the head coach, in fact, who was on a paltry salary, which included meets. So the head coach was working in championship meet, all sessions, so on deck from 6.30 a.m. until finals ended after 9 p.m., plus the fact that none of the other coaches ever got experience working at a meet. Training was cut back little by little to save money. There was resentment between the parents on the board and the coaching staff. And then bigger meets like speedo sectionals were avoided so the club didn't pay for coaches to travel to meets outside the area. So in those rare times when swimmers did make the cuts, The swimmers were discouraged to go by the board, or they were told they would have to pay all of their expenses as well as the expenses of the coach, including travel, accommodations, meals, coaching time. I often said the club's motto should have been, if my swimmer can't beat yours, I'll hold yours back. There was this terrible environment among the parents where success was met with envy and even hostility. They suffered from what we called schadenfreude, which is taking pleasure from the misfortune of others. And still we stayed. So eventually, a small group of parents pushed to make a change, so I was hired as head coach. I was a little used assistant before and then coached in another club where we had moved our son 
um, we had moved him and then we let uh, our daughter stay, stay there so that, because she was just starting out and it was closer to home and she had friends there. When I started as head coach there, over time, the board was reformed with people who would work to make the club better for everyone, not just themselves. And I was involved in a lot of that. They raised the fees, kept out of the pool functions, and basically did the meat organization, fundraising, and other administrative functions. And things improved over those first three years. Swimmers were happy, and the overwhelming majority of parents were happy. The club was improving and growing and had gone from somewhere around 20th to 25th place at every LSC championships for as long as I can remember every year to being the top 10 and winning the small team title a couple of times. Financially, the club went from always being short of money to being very stable and even having money to rent pool space and 50 meter pools in the summer or even at uh, Colgate University from time to time. Summer participation went from less than 20 swimmers to over 80 within two years. Then one person came onto the board that completely changed the trajectory of the club forever. He climbed from a basic board member to president quickly and then changed personality. He became someone in a position of control committed to completely devastating the club. My son was probably one of the only people that saw that coming and he never really trusted him even when he, because he was so much younger. And it can happen just like that. I started getting the idea that trouble was afoot when the president refused to write contracts with the coaches, something that we've asked for and that, that he had supported previously when he was a board member. Comments made by board members who were allies of the president about unspecified problems on the team when there really weren't many and no explanations were ever given of what the problems really were, but just saying that there were problems. They used words like safety and unfair and they used, you know, kind of trick words like that that they never had to define, but they always used just if they were something very serious. The board started making more and more unreasonable requirements, like to have all swimmers changing groups, being approved by them, and to hold some swimmers back when it wasn't really in their lane. Board members would sit on the balcony during practices, taking notes about practices for future complaints. Then the board members became, the board meetings became closed and the activities were kept secret. People started getting suspicious, but board meetings were also very contentious. And then good board members wound up resigning and, and you know, sometimes leaving the club totally. The president started violating bylaws and appointed people who would support him rather than holding elections and having others elected. This included appointing his wife to be on the board with him as a second board member from the same family, the same Swimmer family, which is in a direct violation of the club bylaws, as it is in most places. Complaints by anonymous sources brought up by to the coaches like they were indictments were common. Almost every board meeting I was, I was forced to go to. Financial reports and board meeting minutes stopped being made public to the membership, so nobody ever knew what was going on. Relationships between the board and the coaching staff over, over those years went from contentious to divisive to combative to hostile. In fact, the board passed a zero-tolerance rule that held that anyone, a parent, coach, swimmer who spoke negatively about any board member or the board in general, in public or private, was to be immediately thrown off the team and no refund of fiends would be given. All they had to do was be suspected of it, basically. They had secret meetings with a high school coach, which when I first started seeing those, I started getting a little suspicious. I started getting really suspicious. Forget about a little bit. Um, an assistant coach who was also a swim parent was who was calling the board on and the president on their bylaw violations was fired and they did it in the, in the middle of practice. He was running the practice and all of a sudden this herd of, of thugs came in. They looked like thugs and uh, he was fired right then and there in the middle of practice. And in addition to make it worse, his daughter was kicked off the team at the same time. She was told to get out of the pool and get dressed and leave. It was just a horrible experience. When we were finishing better than any other time in the team's history, the president put together a report that he presented to the board that showed without question that the club was failing and well behind every club in our area. Of course, a tiny, tiny print on it had this disclaimer saying that any swimmer who did not comply with the standard training of the, of the club, in the president's opinion, were not included in the report. I remember that board meeting. The president wanted me to answer the charges of incompetence since we had shown the, he had shown the club was failing in spite of finishing in the top 10 in the LSC and scoring more than 100 points at Speedo sectionals just before that. 
This report was particularly nasty because of the sheer fraud involved in concocting it. And it was a, the screw that was used to lead to other actions. Since the idea that the coaches were incompetent, and particularly me as head coach, the president staged this no-confidence vote, which I was, it was clear I was going to lose, and it was clear I was being set up for. Then after, um, after that season, they hired the high school coach, who was a failure as a coach and a teacher. He just wasn't good at either. And he asked me to be his assistant, but the club would no longer have room for our, my two kids. Um, plus my wife was, was a coach on the team. So both of us were to be coaches, but our kids had to swim somewhere else. So after two years of torture, this group of seven pa parents out of 60 got their way in. We wound up leaving the club. Since that time, the club has gone from about 95, which was our limit that the board has set for me, uh, because of the facility to less than 50. They went from top 10 in the LSC to, I think last time they were 28th in the LSC. And from swimmers succeeding in college to swimmers quitting swimming completely sometime, you know, later in high school or when they got to college. And the swimmers that stayed for the most part never managed to improve all that much because, you know, the coach, it, they became really that, that kind of program that nobody really ever improved. And they all stayed because it was convenient or something like that. Most of the better swimmers scattered to two or three mediocre teams in the area. And so it went, the team going from meaningless club built up to not only be successful in the pool, but also financially stable back to a meaningless club in less than 10 years at the hands of, you know, fewer than seven parents, really, with most of it concocted by two parents. It was also two years of torture to the coaches and particularly me as head coach and swimmers. Several of us still carry the scars of this ordeal. I remember it all started after our best finish at LSE Long Course Championships. Emails were sent to me with unreasonable requirements for reports, projections, goals, and not just goals like, you know, we want to grow by 10 swimmers or something, but goals like they wanted my name down in, in blood pretty much um, to, to use against me later on. And then this other information that they, they needed or about what, you know, uh, just stuff that was sort of pie in the sky guessing that they wanted me because they wanted to, to use it against me. The point here isn't to rant about a bad experience I had with the board of a club. I wanted to be clear here that I'm not suggesting that the Victor Swim Club board is anything remotely in common with this one club's board of directors. But there are three points to this story that I want to make clear. First of all, swim clubs need to be led by the head coach. I'm very sure of this. In my times in the sport, a strong head coach makes all the difference in the world. And when the head coach was not part of the board of directors in a position of authority, not just someone that just sits at board's meetings, those were the clubs that struggled or failed. If a swim club is going to be successful, the swimming part has to be the first, has to be first, and has to be done right. That starts with the right person in the head coaching position. This is a very difficult position to fill under the best of times. You need someone who has knowledge of swimming to the point where the system of teaching and coaching has to be solid and evolving with the growth of the club. And the coach has to be able to manage people, especially the coaching staff, but also the swimmers and the parents. As I mentioned last week, we receive a lot of complaints from parents. A strong head coach will be able to handle these positively and reduce the need for parents to complain, not by caving to every demand, but to communicate effectively with those parents so complaints aren't necessary. Not that people won't disagree, but to explain that the system, requirements, and policies are clear and equitable. The head coach also needs to have vision for the team so it will move forward and grow and be successful. I was a young head coach when I first started, but my third coaching job, when I was still in my 20s, my early 20s in fact, was as a, head, as a co head coach with an older coach who I had known for several years. We had totally different strengths, and he was in his mid 50s, and I was in my early 20s. Our relationship with swimmers was completely different. But we complemented each other and ended up growing the team and winning LSC championships when nothing had ever been close to that before. The board was selected by us to do the necessary work, but to stay in their lane when it came to the swimming part. In those days, parents were more inclined to leave their children at the pool and to pick them up later. We attracted swimmers from a very wide area because of the success and improvement and the swimmers that we were coaching. More importantly, we knew what we wanted the club to do, be and where we wanted it to go. Part of this is because the head coach, in theory, can be the club at the club for several years, and parents are generally on the club board for around three years on average. 
To have any chance of consistency or stability, the head coach has to be the consistent part of the leadership. When we first came to Victor, I was a bit taken back by the president at the time insisting that the coaches, especially the head coach, being considered just an employee with no role in the leadership. I immediately started getting flashbacks to the previous nightmare we had lived through and had an uneasy feeling that the same disaster could come to that. But eventually, that leadership left and more reasonable leadership was in place who gave the head coach more of a role in leading the club. I've made an observation and have vocalized this a few times that there are basically two kinds of swim clubs. There are those clubs that are in high school swimming that are high school swimming centric and that they they're focused on preparing the swimmers for high school swimming and the club meets in the club season are very much secondary. Then there are the club center clubs that are focused on the USA swimming season and club swimming experience. While high school swimming is a part of that, it's not the focus for the club. Swimmers are trained for club swimming events, and the focus is success in USA swimming meets. Let's say making LSE championships, speedo sectionals, futures, juniors, senior nationals, over making high school sectionals in states is more of the focus. Focus on swimming well over a 36-week short course season rather than a 12- or 14-week high school season, and then following that up with a 14-week long course season. So we're swimming year-round instead of for a very short period of time. There are those very rare few like Carmel Swim Club and Carmel High School in Indiana that can be all things to all people. And the two sides of their program are in lockstep with each other because the coaching is identical. It's the same people coaching the the club team as the high school team. And they do both very, very well. But this is so rare. Even the monster programs like Mission Viejo, Sandpipers of Nevada, Nation's Capital, Nitro, Swim Mac, Dynamo are less focused on high school swimming and more on club season and are more of what I would say are club-centric programs. Where the, program, where the problems happen is when two things happen at the same time. There's a group of parents who want very much for the club to focus on high school, even though that leaves out several swimmers on the club, and enough of those parents gain control of the club by being on the board so they can change the type of club it is. This is where the vision of the head coach is important. Let's be clear here. Clubs change and evolve, and some go from being club-centric to being high school-centric organically without a coup. But if that is the choice of the membership and the head coach and is done properly, that's fine. It's when a few parents take over the club and change it to their liking. That's when the trouble begins. Leadership of the club in terms of the head coach and board needs to know what kind of program they are and what they want to be. The second point of all this is the leadership of the club is the responsibility of all the members, swimmers, and coaches. This isn't to say that every parent should want to be on the board. Some just don't have the time or the interest. But when the leadership of the club is being decided, parents especially, all parents with swimmers on the club, need to be involved and to take those choices and elections very seriously. I've shown what can happen when one parent with the wrong intention is put into a position of authority. Members of the board need to be considered carefully to make sure the club leadership is balanced. Being on the board is not about about making the board do what one person wants or protecting the interests of the board members. It is the responsibility of the board to help run the entire club for all the members. This isn't to take opportunity away from some while piling on others. I'm always interested when I hear parents contacting the newest member of a parent board of a swim club, putting their grievances putting their grievances in front of them, which usually involves taking training time away from the seniors, whoever the top group is, and giving it to usually the middle group or wherever the parent has a swimmer. It's like there's this idea that being on the board gives those on it infinite control to right the wrongs others believe are a problem. That is, in my opinion, the kind of person who should be kept far, far away from the parent board and running any youth sports club. I remember one time I coached uh, a coach-owned club, in Florida. The head coach was the 1976 U.S. women's head coach and a legend in the sport. His board of directors was made up of former swimmers and parents of former swimmers from his club. It worked out so well because they all had a vested interest in the club's success um, that they're, you know, because their children were involved in it at one time. And yet, they were practical and unbiased about how they made decisions about the structure of fees and the financial management of the club. It was also interesting that I was the executive director of the board, whose membership were all powerful people in the local business community. They were all tasked with some oversight about the club, but mostly to help fundraise and PR. In fact, I had full access to the Alamo Car Rental Marketing Department to promote the club, advertise, and help promote our fundraisers. All reports were printed and set along with an agenda at least two weeks before the meetings. 
All topics needed to, needing discussion were given in executive summaries with the necessary details so that everything to be discussed was laid out. Meetings had to last for an hour or less, and if there were too many questions about a particular topic, the point was tabled until I could provide proper detailed information to allow them to make a clear decision. It was a lot of work on my part, but the board functioned flawlessly. It was an amazing group to be part of. Okay, so back to our points. Once the board members are elected and in place, parents have an obligation to go to board meetings and to pay attention to the actions being taken. Those board members represent all members of the club. Being a parent on the parent governed clubs is more than just writing a check to the club and working at meets, buying pies and coffee during fundraisers. It's being supportive of the board and acting as oversight on decisions of the board. It isn't to say you criticize everything that the board does and it doesn't help your child or, or things you disagree with. It does mean you support the club's board and have faith in them that they're working to the best interest of the club and all the swimmers. The final point is that the coaching staff is part of the club leadership and should also be supported by the board and the parents. This is especially true of the head coach since he or she is the vision for the club and the tone of the club is determined largely by the head coach. You kind of always say that the, the club is best reflected by the coach. You know, the, the coach's personality is reflected by the team, I guess, or something like that. Being a Monday morning quarterback isn't helpful. Being openly critical of the coach isn't helpful either, and it's not going to help improve the club. It takes a lot of time and effort to keep the club running, especially in these extremely challenging times. If someone has ideas for improvement in the club or situation and a way to do that, then work with the head coach and the board to make it happen. Don't just give naked criticism like you don't know how much time your kid is getting or you don't like the hours of practice. If you want to change something, work with the board. Help, help them make that happen. And, and get us more, more pool time somewhere. The strength of the club also has to do with the strength of the membership. Those nine members of the board of the club in Florida where I coached was selected because of two things, their history with the club and also their skills and contacts. Everyone on the club has contacts and skills. Putting those to work for the club is important for the success of the club and the swimmers. As we move the club forward, we'll need to dig deep for the skills and contacts that our members um, and the parents have to make their growth possible. We all want our kids to leave a mark on the club, but parents can also make their mark on the club and